Hey everybody, just Doc Sol back with five deadly sins of PowerPoint. I originally called this the five deadly sins of PowerPoint, but I know there's a bunch more than this. These are just the five that leapt to mind while I was making this PowerPoint. First one is too many words. If you're anything like me, this paragraph just looks like a cloud of letters. And a couple of things can happen. One, you start skimming it and then you give up and you don't get all the information. People don't even notice, for example, that there's a poem at the end of this. Two, some of you are trying to read this word by word and simultaneously listen to me. And you're probably not getting 100% of either one, no matter how well you think you uh, can multitask. So very wordy slides are really uh, tough for learning. Here's where I took the exact same information that I had on the other slide and just condensed it down into bullets, like you were taking notes for somebody. In this case, you could see that we can get to the information pretty quick. The tendency of students to write down every word is still a little bit of a problem with the bullets, but much less so than every single word in that big paragraph. And you can do things like add links if you have more detail that you want to um, expound upon. So here's a link to the poem that I put at the end, either when you give students the PowerPoint electronically at the end of the day, or if you want to open it up during class, you can do it through that link. Now, so number two is bullets. Just taught you how to use bullets because it was good, but like any good thing, you can have too much. Okay, the solution of this is animation. What I want to do is instead of presenting this entire body of information at once, I want to walk students through it. The way to do that is really simple. If you go back into the editing part of whether you're using PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever, um, somewhere there's going to be an animations feature. It's not transitions. That's where you can go slide to slide. Animations is done within an individual slide. Really easy to do. I'm just going to select the first thing that I want to show. And I'm going to decide how it's going to appear. So what's going to happen is the title will appear on this page with nothing else. And then each bullet is going to show up one by one when I click. So I like to use um, the fade feature. It's subtle but attention grabbing. You saw that it demoed it there, there for a second. and I don't usually have to use too much over here, but you can either start it after a certain time or when you click, you can spread out how long it takes to fade in or condense that. There's all kinds of little things you can play with, but for our purposes, I just want to show you how easy it is to do a super simple version of this. Uh, you know, I'm doing it in real time it will be done in seconds. So if I take that second bullet point, tell it to fade in, that becomes number two, as you see there. Here's three, oops, four, and five. So now, if we show this slide, it looks very different. It starts out with just the title. Then I'm in control as to when people see the solution to the previous sin is its own sin. And I can expand on this so that they're taking their notes on what I'm saying instead of trying to write down every single word on the whole screen. And you can just walk them right through just by clicking each time. All right. When you finish, it'll just go on to the next slide. And you can see that I've used some animation on this next slide. And just like the last time, the previous solution to sin was a sin itself. Animation can be overdone. This is cute for a while, but eventually it wears on you. And if you, for example, have students who are doing presentations, they love to use every possible animation in every slide. And after four or five presentations, you might want to tear your hair out. It gets to be more about what kind of animation is coming up next then about what kind of information is coming up next. So animations are great, just don't make it into a circus. Just say no. Reading the slide. So here I have just read the slide to you, but one of the problems that I see in people who misuse PowerPoint is they lean too hard on the slide, especially if it's something like that first slide where there's a lot of words to read verbatim. 
this is not great no matter how you slice it. Reading the slide is, is bad because most people read with poor inflection. You start to sound like a robot, it gets super boring. It can be a little insulting. People can read. Now, of course, there are exceptions. If you have an ESL class or something else like that, you're modeling good English language reading. There's an exception to every rule. But for the most part, let people absorb what's on there and give them richness that expands on all those bullets and things that you're putting in. When you're looking at your screen, your eyes are not on your students. Now, these are not evil people who need to be watched like they're going to throw a knife at you. But you're much more in tune to what's happening in the class if you can look out, see what people are doing, gauge body language, and all of that. And that gets easier and easier to do the longer you've been teaching because your multitasking ability is better in your, in your brain. Now, if you must, um, do some reading. There's a bunch of reasons why that might happen. The subject is pretty new to you and you're not feeling confident. You know it's going to be a confusing day. Um, I use it sometimes because I sometimes have to give out some very sensitive information. Like as a, um, as a politician, I need to use the exact set of words that I sat down for two hours and figured out so that I'm communicating things in a way that, that a public, the public will understand and that won't get the whole town into legal trouble and all kinds of stuff. So there are good reasons why you could possibly do that. Um, let me go in here and show you how to add something that you can read if you want to. The key thing here is to add notes. So the notes feature is at the bottom down here. If you don't see it, it may be like all the way down like this. Here's the little notes thing that will pop it back up again. You just type or paste whatever you want in here and you can slide it up so you can see more of it while you're editing like this. And then the way you're going to use this is in presenter mode. So now if you hook most computers up to an exterior um, uh, projector or TV or whatever else, it's automatically going to switch PowerPoint into presentation mode. Um, I'm not connected to anything, so I'm going to use a different method where I go to the slide and then right click on it and choose presenter view. So when you're presenting, here's what it's going to look like. On the left hand side, this big thing is what your students are seeing. Up on the second monitor, the one that's in front of your students, that's all they see. You see on the right top side here um, what's going to happen next. So I can see my next little animated um, bullet point there and any notes you want to put in here. So this can be a full transcript if you want it to be. Or sometimes I'll just like write little things like tell the story about the turkey or you know whatever is going to stimulate my memory uh, in using this. And as you roll through, you continue to see what's here, what's next, what's here, what's next. And it's a nice, a nice tool once you learn how to use it. Now, there's no surprise uh, what's coming up next. PowerPoint addiction. Notice that there was a lot on that slide, but now that I'm in pre presentation mode, you're not seeing all of it. We can walk through it together. Some teachers use it all the time, like to death for the whole class. This can narrow the curriculum quite a bit. If you get too reliant on your own summaries of things, you start to narrow things down to just what's on your PowerPoint. One of my least favorite things to hear from somebody who I'm going to evaluate as a teacher is, what are you going to do in class today? I'm doing PowerPoint number 73 because there are folks who just roll through their PowerPoints. Once again, it, it's, uh, it can disconnect you from your students. It creates passive learners. It's very teacher focused. And we know that active learning pedagogies are not just more fun, not just more engaging, but significantly more effective than simple lectures, even when enhanced with all the pictures and all the animations and all the things you can do with PowerPoint. It's just not ideal to use for the whole class. So the solution is just right tool for the right job, just like you'd hear a carpenter say, right? If you do nothing but carry a hammer as a carpenter, you can't cut wood, you can't do all that stuff. Same thing with tools in teaching. PowerPoint is great. It's really good for supporting visual learners. It helps us to keep track. 
When we're keeping track, we're more efficient. When we're doing those little bursts of direct instruction that we need to do to prep students to do big activities or whatever we want to do as more active pedagogies, they're just not good for everything. So just be aware of that. All right, that's it for how to do these things, friends. I did want to say uh, I did not spend 50 hours on this thing. I don't use PowerPoint very much for the reasons that I stated before. So I can't just like roll through and make them real fast. I know people who could just go and go crazy. So I think my PowerPoint here was fine. I have one that I'm a little bit more impressed with to show you some of the more features of um, PowerPoint. This is one that I gave um, at a professional conference of uh, religious people who are concerned about the environment, uh, some of whom were ecologists. So it's very sort of faith focused. I'm not here to proselytize to y'all. It's just what the topic happens to be. Um, but I want to show you how I approached this. This is a PowerPoint where if you were to get a copy of it, you would probably not know what the heck I was talking about. And the reason for that is that the whole PowerPoint is about giving prompts and visual support for the things that I'm going to be saying. So once again, we have, uh, I'm trying to introduce people to the idea of the city as an ecosystem, that it functions as an ecosystem. And then I'm going to go from the idea that it's an ecosystem to say that, hey, our ecosystem doesn't treat everybody inside it equally. And there's problems in our poorer and minority dominated parts of the ecosystem. So we start off what the city is. I've got a definition of urban here from the Census Bureau and one that I propose of my own that I ask them to um, consider. Just showing a picture of a city here to ground ourselves in the idea that when we see steel and concrete and stuff, we don't think of the word ecosystem, but there it is. That is a functioning ecosystem. It's got all the cycles. It's got all the stuff that you need to be a living system. And of course the people. And what you can see happening here now is I'm not even pressing the button. What I've done is I've had them come up on a timer so that I can sort of narrate over without distracting myself and people can just kind of absorb sights of the city and um, be able to enjoy that way. And then I have a bullet point, you know, stack here, like you saw in the last thing. Sort of proof that it's an ecosystem, it's all natural. Then I'm transitioning here, talking about how just because it's not usually thought of as nature, there's a lot of nature, including this very unusual man, uh, out in the cities and that life will happen anywhere you let it these the example for that is these cracks down here on the bottom that you know as soon as you have a crack in what humans have made life will burst through in all kinds of diversity just like in any other kind of an ecosystem and there's the apex predator of that ecosystem now we start what i'm going to do here is use pictures to compare and contrast between the natural built world and the human built world. So we think we build up things and we destroy nature and all that sort of thing, but so do these guys, these guys here, right? So if you're a trout and a beaver comes along, you're about to die, right? Because the stream that you used to be living in is going to be turned into a pond and there's not enough bubbling and moving of the water to have enough oxygen. The temperature rises, it stinks. But at the same time, that beaver is creating a new habitat for other things that might want to live there, like we do in the city with pigeons and people and puppies and unfortunately rats and stuff like that. All right, now I'll just kind of cruise through these. These are some case studies. So again, you can just see the theme of walking people through various ideas. And I'll just skip forward here and show you. There are some scripture passages in here that are necessarily long. Okay, so you can't always get away without having wordy slides. So here's a very wordy slide that if I gave it to you all like this would be completely impenetrable, but I can make it slightly better by sequencing it the way we saw before. So um, you know, because people want to hear the actual quoted words from whatever version of the Bible you're doing, you end up having to have paragraphs or lines at a time. 
But again, if we walk people through, it becomes much more palatable. So there you have it, my five deadly sins of PowerPoint. I'd love it if you would leave me your own. If you have other ideas about how to make better PowerPoints, please let me know and we'll add them to the next video. Have a wonderful day.